thank you, Bora, and thank you, Dylan, for an awesome talk. If you are in the kids space and you're not paying attention to uh, the super awesome insights through letter and research, you should be. It's, there's very few people who are actually gathering data in this in our demographic, and uh, theirs is one that we that we pay a lot of attention to. So. Yes, Animal Jam is our principal product and IP. Uh, it is made with, in association with uh, National Geographic. They, uh, Wildworks owns and operates it, National Geographic. We license uh, some content from them and they contribute a lot to the educational content that is kind of built into the DNA of Animal Jam. So we have uh, some 89, 90 million animals running around in Animal Jam, uh, coming up on 30 million players. Uh, revenue that's been um, uh, growing astronomically year over year. Um, we now have an office here in Amsterdam. We recently changed our name from Smart Bomb to be a little more kid friendly and we have this little cat thing now that doesn't have a name so if you have any suggestions afterwards I'd love to hear them. Um, that by way of introduction, what I'm going to talk about, we have uh, recently decided to take Animal Jam into the mobile space from the web space where it has uh, had enjoyed its success so far. And in so doing, we've, we've hit a lot of questions that I think might be interesting for those of you who are developers or publishers here. Just to give you an idea of who we're talking about, our demographics are, uh, our sweet spot is probably 7 to 11. A uh, little bit more girls than boys, though both genders play. This is the largest social network and online playground for kids in North America. By the middle of this year, it will be the largest in the world. Um, the challenges that we hit then in taking this to mobile and deciding what that should be, the first one is obvious is what is it? What's it, what's it going to do? We started with a few assumptions. We, uh, Animal Jam was built in 2D and Flash, so it would be ubiquitous uh, and easy to deploy on the web. And we didn't want to just bring the Flash 2D experience across to 3D. We wanted to do something that would, that would look unique. We've been working with the Unity engine for a long time. And we wanted to bring it across in 3D. Uh, we knew that we would need some form of offline play. The uh, play patterns are quite a bit different on tablets than they are on the, uh, on the web, on the PC. An average play session uh, during a summer when school is out in Animal Jam is over 70 minutes. And that typically doesn't happen straight shot on mobile devices. Kids might play that much over the course of a day, but they're jumping around uh, among multiple apps. Um, and we knew that the educational components of Animal Jam, though we, we never call it educational in front of kids because that, that's the kiss of death, uh, we knew that those components are very important to parents. They're part of the success of the brand and they're something that we do uh, want to carry forward. Um, so parts of Animal Jam that we should bring across. In considering what the web, what uh, really Animal Jam is, it's kind of a, uh, it's a theme park with a lot of different uh, attractions. It's, there's dress up, there's single multiplayer adventures, there's mini games, uh, there's world building, uh, role playing, educational content. Uh, should one mobile app really try to be all of those things? So we, do, we kind of started by looking at the elements of these different things that are successes in the app store. Uh, and see what the similarities are with Animal Jam on the web. But there are also some important differences. In kids' games, uh, at least, there's uh, very little chat or social uh, content. That's really not what they're about. Um, there's not often any user-generated content. There is some creative outlet there, but generally you're taking some prescribed pieces of a world and, and uh, putting them together in a fairly limited fashion. In uh, real world physical toys, you might compare that to, to play sets where there is some opportunity for creativity there, but you're kind of playing within a world that's been constructed for you. And there's not uh, the, the completely open outlet that there is with uh, something like the sandbox games, um, where there is fantastic creative poten uh, potential. There is deep social play, but, and this might come as a shock to those of you who haven't played it, some of them are not for kids. Minecraft is not a kids game. If you've ever been on a Minecraft server that is not a private server run by a parent who saw an open Minecraft server and became concerned, then you know what I'm talking about. It's, uh, it is not moderated or filtered like a kid's game. Um, it is not, uh, not all of them are a safe place to let your kids run around. However, uh, there are those that are um, uh, they're keeping control over their playground, I guess. And uh, I think as, if parents are aware of what they're doing, these are fantastic toys. They could be compared 
Uh, as Dylan mentioned, the constructor toys are enjoying a lot of success right now. The real world equivalent to, uh, to some of these builder toys. Some of these, uh, these sandbox games might be compared to a construction site in both its, uh, its good and bad aspects. And then there's the social networks where it's all about the social, it's all about the content sharing, but there's absolutely no moderation, no uh, personal information control, um, no bullying protection, none of the things that you would hope for from a kid's playground. And in a kid's mind, they might be tempted to compare this to a, uh, to a tea party with their friends, but in fact, it's really more like a tea party in a Hieronymus Bosch painting and probably not some place that uh, parents want to let their kids wander around. So, in thinking about which uh, of these elements we're going to blend together, <clears throat> the other question that that raises for us is, where does it belong in the App Store? Um, one of the, uh, <clears throat> you know, is this, is this in kids and family? Where, do our, where does our demographic go to look for fun things to do in the App Store? Um, the education category is, uh, is easy to chart in, but nobody but parents looks in the, look in the education category. Uh, kids, relatively easy to chart in, not as competitive as the games category, which as you all know is very competitive, very difficult to, uh, uh, to make any headway in. This is a comparison um, between the top 50 in the US, uh, on the left there, in the games category, top grossing apps on the right in the kids category. The number one game in the kids category only makes it up as far as number 65 in, uh, in the games category. And the next game on the list makes it only so far as one, 151. The opportunity um, is obviously for, for revenue is quite a bit higher where it's less regulated in the games category. However, our goal in building Animal Jam has been to build a social network and kids' property, uh, hopefully an enduring one <clears throat> that will work across multiple media. So we feel that our game uh, belongs in kids, it belongs possibly in social networking, um, and that uh, to, uh, to do what I think some games have done, which is uh, steer away from directing themselves to kids specifically so that they hopefully uh, escape the legislative ban hammer that's coming. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for us, and I don't think it's going to work in the long term for a lot of the companies that are, that are trying it. Another question for us is, you know, we have 30 million plus players uh, who are engaged in this, this web-based social networking now. What do we do with them? How do we connect them in the mobile game to the web we'll game? To what happens if through. I am snarky, super awesome the in the web game, and I want to game. move over to the mobile game, and somebody's already taken the name Snarky, super awesome. Maybe even Dylan. Um, it sort of just reminded me how cool it is to try and complete a collection, I and and that, oh. and that was what we wanted to do. Like most other free-to-play games, Who might is have that? Like some characters are better than others, but we didn't. It's wisdom from beyond. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's oh, okay. <clears throat> My breakfast not sitting well. Maybe it's, uh, so. So. What are we going to do to connect these databases? What are we going to do to connect one game to the other game, and how is that going to work? Because we have to at least carry their personas across from a, in a social networking sense from one place to the other. However, we've had four plus years now to build up content and everything in Animal Jam. If we tried to just rebuild all that content in the mobile in 3D, it would be another four and a half years before the game came out. And we can't do that either. So. It really comes down to how we structure those social features. And the way that we're, we've done it <clears throat> is these social features are built around buddy cards the way that they are in Animal Jam Web. So I can, uh, I can make a new buddy by tapping on somebody in the world and sending them a request. Once we're buddies, I can then send them messages. <clears throat> I can see when they're online. I can visit their den. There are different levels of chat access depending on the level of parental permission that you've, uh, yeah, you've received as a kid. Been, you, know, you do have the ability to type chat in messages. That goes through both and so, white uh, and blacklist filtering. Uh, it goes through some heuristics that, uh, that we use to prevent bullying and to detect any uh, attempts to exchange personal identifying information. However, uh, if you have any system of signification, kids are going to find some way around it even if all, every 
key on your keyboard did was make a beeping sound, they would find a way to communicate with that. Right? Um, it's impossible to filter it perfectly, and we have all of the same difficulties that a real-world playground does. Uh, however, it's you know, uh, magnified quite a bit when it's happening online, and you know, parents are justifiably concerned about that. So if you enter, and this is how this is going to, to work for us, if you enter your Animal Jam user credentials, when you join the mobile game, it will bring your persona over from the web game in that you will be able to use the same user credentials with a single sign-on system on both. That means that we're pre-populating the mobile game with all of the names of the members from the web game. However, it is a new game, so you'll be starting, there's new animals, there's new everything, but you will be able to carry your social networking persona from one to the other. So if I'm, uh, if I'm Clark uh, in, in one, I'm going to be Clark in the next one too. <clears throat> this is the big question, and here's my opportunity to moralize about uh, monetization in kids' games. <clears throat> so how are we going to make money in a way that makes parents feel like they're getting value for the money and not just feeding it to an insatiable beast that is requiring more every time their, their kid plays our game? Um, and obviously, a question that arises from that, subscriptions have been very successful for us. Subscriptions account for two to three million dollars a month in Animal Jam revenue right now. Why would we not continue that in, uh, in the mobile game? And there are a couple of reasons. First one is that uh, Apple does not allow recurring subscriptions in the games category in the App Store. Maybe that's not a big deal. Maybe we don't care about being in the games category. But one that I think is more important <coughs> is that, <coughs> excuse me, Parents don't really dig this model for games and have not really demonstrated it's one that they're interested in. This is a stat that the NPD came out with <clears throat> last week and it's that <clears throat> kids in our demographic are playing, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> sorry, are playing more apps per day than any other demographic of apps users. That is, they're jumping from game to game more often than anybody else. By the time you get to be my age, your app habits have ossified. You are, uh, getting you into a new game is, you know, is really difficult. It's, it takes, what, a $5 CPI or something now. For kids, they're jumping around a lot. If you're a parent, are you gonna be very likely to subscribe and commit to a subscription for a game when your child is playing five different games at the same time? And when they get bored with one or they hit a paywall, they're just jumping to the next free game on the App Store. Probably not. So, my principles of monetizing kids' games uh, in, in four easy to remember uh, little credos. The first one is don't try to redefine free. I have a, a four year old little boy and he loves downloading new games from the App Store. He had downloaded a game a couple of weeks ago. Uh, a, a popular preschool IP, children's characters, and when he got into it, he found that really all it was was just a hub world where he could go around and see all the locked off content that he could play if, he, if we paid something for it. That's not, that's not free. If the core game mechanic isn't free, if you can't experience the core mechanic of the game without having to pay anything, it's not really a free game. It's, these principles are really kind of based on playground log logic. It's, uh, if you think about it the way a kid thinks about it, I think it makes it easier. A storybook where only the first chapter is free is not free. A car uh, in, in a game that you have to pay for, whatever, whatever the content is, I should be able to at least experience the core of the game without paying anything. The, the second one, that when a child buys something, it's theirs, so if I, if I go and make a purchase in a game, I purchase a car, I shouldn't also have to buy gas to run the car. In a child's mind, they've just, made, they've just bought a toy, and if they have the toy, they should be able to play with the toy. Right? To, to double dip like that and ask parents and kids for consumables on top of the, the virtual to object, to um, it, it just, in a, in a kid's mind, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, demonstrating value to parents, I think you know, not every game and app needs to have educational content. Those that don't, I, I don't think should pretend that they do. Um, there are other ways to demonstrate value to parents. Cooperative play, 
creating a game uh, that gives uh, a child experiences that he wants to come and bring back to the parent and talk about. If, you're, if your child is engaging with the family and with the parents outside of the app because of what they're learning or discovering or excited about in the app, then that's great. That demonstrates value to the parents. It's not just something that you, you hand to them for a half an hour so you can get the dishes done. It's something that they're engaged in, you're talking to them about. I think recent studies have demonstrated that the validity of apps for reading and for, uh, for arithmetic are, they, they really are, uh, come about when parents are engaged with kids in doing it. If you're reading to a child or reading with a child, whether it's with an iPad or a book, that is retained and that is building their language skills. If you just drop them in front of an app and expect it to turn them, uh, teach them to read, it, it doesn't work. Um, and finally, don't base the core game mechanics around in-app purchase consumables. I'm not saying that in-app consumables are always bad. There's a line to be walked here. Um, I, I think uh, there, there's, there's a balance. I ask myself this question. If this were a physical toy, would a child understand the value proposition and would a parent feel ripped off? Um, a child should be able to play our Animal Jam mobile game for a couple hours a day without running out of fun stuff to do and without having to pay anything. So an example that I, I like, and I think a game that's really done this well, and this is a couple years old now, is, uh, is Skylanders really Cloud Patrol. The core gameplay here is that I'm, I'm tapping on these guys to, to shoot them and knock them off their platforms or swiping on them, and I can do that infinitely uh, without having to pay anything. This being a Skylanders game, of course, I can pay for things. There's lots of cool characters to unlock and spells and other things that I can, I can get. And the game does give me some incentive to do that. Uh, you know, there, there are different uh, kind of submissions and things I can complete. But the, the principle is, is that that core gameplay that I started with, <clears throat> I can keep doing that and iterating on that and getting my scores better and whatever. I can do that for as long as I like and not have to, to pay anything. That feels fair. Yeah, as, as a parent, I don't mind unlocking a character for my son if he's helped out around the house or something like that. <clears throat> that's, a kind of, that's a kind of reward that a parent can give and feel like uh, there's some value for it. You know, their child's excited about playing with this character, they can unlock it, but they're not sorry that they downloaded the app in the first place. And I think that's something that's become more common uh, in the App Store, even in the kids category. So how are we going about monetization in, in Animal Jam? Uh, one of the stats that we study from Animal Jam Web that I think is really interesting is we look at what does a child do next after their parent buys a membership for them, after they you know, become a subscriber to the game. What's the next thing that they do? Because the next thing that they do is probably the thing that they were most excited about doing that got them to go ask mom and dad for the membership to begin with, right? So what is the most galvanizing thing? What was it that helped them convert from a free to a, a paying player? And when we look at that by a, a large margin, the avatar characters, either more avatar characters or a new animal avatar, a particular one, is the most compelling thing for them. Um, there are, you know, there are other things in the game that we uh, that we observe, but this was uh, by a pretty far margin. So you'll start in the mobile game with a free animal character, as you do. You'll be able to experience the entire online world, all of the educational content, all of the video and other things that we uh, create with National Geographic, all of the social features. Um, we do have a virtual currency. Uh, we use both uh, gems as we do in Animal Jam and sapphires, which are the premium currency. But the way to get that currency is by having your animal avatars, when you're not playing with them, to send them out on little missions where they bring back the currency. So when I'm not playing the game, I'm kind of managing my queue of animal avatars and sending them out to bring back the currency. That means that the more animal avatars I have, the more gems and sapphires I can get. So I have an advantage there in that I earn faster, and those are the things that I use to buy cool things to dress up my wolf and fairy wings in the, in the shop. Um, but uh, that, uh, that, that currency is not buying me more of the core gameplay, it's just buying me the ability to, uh, to change the way that I look and interact in the world. Um, the sales of the new avatars then are going to be the cornerstone of our monetization. 
in keeping with our educational objectives, we are creating fairly robust ebooks about each one of the animal species that our animal avatars come from. And any animal avatar that's sold in the game will come with one of these ebooks. The advantage for kids is that they love learning about their favorite animals. The advantage for parents is that even if my child is no longer playing the social parts of Animal Jam or is no longer engaged in the gameplay parts, the app is still a portal to all of these, uh, these e-books that they've acquired. So if they want to write a report about tigers or if they just want to read about them, they still have this material and it's, it's an enduring uh, value for them. Um, a question that remains then for us is, do we sell the premium currency at all? And the answer is uh, not yet and maybe never. I don't think anybody's tried something quite like what we're doing here, and I, we want to give it a chance to see if it works. I hope to come back and tell you next year that it was fabulously successful, and, uh, but you know, it's, it's experimental. There are other options in, in monetizing in the App Store, and, and I think particularly if you're starting out, if you don't have a, uh, a platform like Animal Jam to begin with to draw people into an app, um, you know, you should definitely be looking at alternatives. You should be looking at advertising for sure with a with a safe advertising uh, platform, because uh, discovery is is very difficult. We have an advantage here in that we have uh, a large audience already that we can draw into this and we can uh, experiment with some alternatives. Um, so not for that. That is oh, the voice is back. There is a lot more in the mobile version of Animal Jam that is coming. There are adventures, there are single and multiplayer uh, things to do. There's a lot of, it's a video platform. There's a lot of really cool video content coming. Um, but these are the kind of the questions that got us starting and thinking about it. And if you'd like to see what the results look like so far, the, there's a closed beta going on. Before now, it was just posted on Animal Jam and uh, on Twitter and that we have about 16,000 kids testing it. It's for Android tablets. Um, the game itself will launch in April, but we would love your feedback if you'd like to take a look at how the closed beta social network for kids is running now. Well, that's it. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Clark, for a great talk. Are there any questions? Okay, well, I have one to start the questions. Oh, There's did someone ask? Ah, yay. And the mic actually works. The, um, the issues with Apple's subscription and allowing subscription only to so-called media applications, it's a bit of a gray area. Um, we do see a lot of other semi-media applications that are running subs. But my question for you is, are you allowing subscribers on your online service user login to unlock full content in the mobile service? No, not to unlock full content. They will, they will have separate inventories. There may be benefits that we give to a member in, or a subscriber in the web version. Perhaps that you know, gives you a, a boost in virtual currency here. Ultimately, if we try and take all the monetization out of the App Store, we're, we're going to run afoul of the, of the platform holders. Um, and you know, they, we try to be partners to them in, in that regard. Uh, you know, The whole subscription thing for kids, I, I don't see it coming. You can't compete with free. And there's so much free video, there's so much free content, free apps, that even if the apps are all just kind of rapacious money grubbers and don't give you any gameplay, they're still free. And uh, a child still has fun just downloading and trying it out. So subscriptions are going to be, uh, are, it's going to be a tough road to hoe for those that, uh, that want to try it. Um, I, I think we have the luxury of experimenting with a few different things, and we probably will. But as of now, we're not contemplating a... Uh, a hybrid subscription that exists both on the web and on mobile. Um, <clears throat> probably a, a significant factor behind that is Apple's policy, though. More questions? Uh, oh, yes. Excellent. Hi. Um, so your user base at the moment is predominantly on the web, if I'm, not, if I'm correct. Um, I was wondering if you're having a challenge in migrating those users from web to mobile, and if you are, how are you approaching that? Uh, ask me in April uh, when the game launches, but we, it's, not, it's not our first rodeo entirely. We, we released a, a little app kind of as an experiment called AJ Jump uh, a little over a year ago, 
and it's a little it's a little jumping app. You can earn gems for the web game by playing this mobile game. And we really wanted to see, I mean, in part it was kind of an internal game jam, but also we wanted to see how many purchases could we drive doing no other user acquisition except just announcement and Animal Jam. And so this was a $1.99 app that we put up and we announced it and we had something like 150,000 purchases in a, in a weekend. So we, we know that we can, uh, and that's, a, that's for a paid app. And that was also when our user base was uh, you know, almost two years ago. So we, driving, driving kids to start playing the app is, I don't think is a big concern. For us, it's really, the importance is gonna be engagement and not monetization. I, I'm really not uh, you know, putting anything in our projections monetization-wise out of this in, in the short term. What we wanna do is find the best way to engage with kids, make sure that we have all the safety features right and everything working. Um, if we can, you know, as, as Dylan's talk pointed out, there are a lot of people looking for the, ch the kids' audience right now, and we, we have a pretty substantial one. Uh, we can always find ways to attach value to that if, if need be. Dylan. That's that's a good question. Um, it, you you probably know as well as anybody. Sessions tend to be a lot shorter, and they also tend to be offline or migrating offline, online and offline. Uh, I think that you're going to see you know, the reason we have kind of this appointment mechanic in there with earning gems your av uh, with your avatars is that you'll be able to check in to the game multiple times a day. I think that more of the social networking is going to be asynchronous in this than it is in. Animal Jam Web. Kids get on Animal Jam Web and they camp out and they've got it going while they're doing their homework and, and they're chatting with friends at the same time. It's going to be a lot more asynchronous messages going back and forth. And so we're looking at ways that we can do more asynchronous content exchange with uh, you know, kind of a, a media wall where I can post things and exhibit things. So I think it's going to be shorter sessions checking in, but you know, multiple throughout the day after school. Peter, okay. Um, <clears throat> do you have any plans to release this on phone or is it gonna be iPad only? And if so, what, what are your ideas about kids owning phones and accessing content that way? Is, is it for iPad only? Or Actually, the, the beta test that's running right now is just on Android tablets. It's a little easier to deploy a beta on Android if you've, if you've been through it, but uh, it is being developed simultaneously on both. So in April, when it releases, it will release on both iPad and Android tablets. Uh, we're not contemplating smaller screens right now just because the, uh, the chat interface becomes really problematic on a, on a small screen. If you saw a little bit of the, the chat footage in there, you can see that you know, yeah, there's no way to keep it from obscuring part of the screen. And, uh, until we figure out, uh, there may be a companion app that works on a smaller screen, but it will be both Android and iOS tablets. All right, thank you so much, Clark, for thank a great talk. I'm 